So my name is James Bottomley and I'm here to talk to you today about a practical guide to using Git from a kernel maintainer's perspective. As you can see from the cover slide, I actually work for Novell, but I'm SCSI subsystem maintainer and I spend a lot of my time using Git on a daily basis to run the SCSI subsystem. Um, when Linus first started producing Git, which was after the Bit BitKeeper fiasco we'll get into later on in the slides, the SCSI subsystem was actually the first subsystem to get a merge going inside Linus's nascent Git tree. Um, so with that, let me move on to the introduction. The talk I'm about to give you was actually based on an unconference presentation at Freedom Hack in Los Angeles. Um, something we have to get uh, right straight off the bat is that Git is actually completely huge. Right at the moment, if you type git dash tab, you'll find there are something like 200 different commands. So obviously this talk, which only lasts half an hour, the original one I did lasted an hour, will not cover even a fraction of that. Um, so the slides say ask if you want to know something, but actually send me or someone at the Linux Foundation an email if you want to know something. Um, one of the key things that you have to get correct in your mind when you use Git is that Git actually has two modes of use. Um, I've listed them here as historical and de developmental. The historical mode of Git is the way Linus uses Git, and it basically means his tree never rebases. So he never takes work he's done in Git and ports it to a new branch, swaps patches around, does other stuff. He believes that once something is committed to his tree, it's an irre irrevocable part of history, and he can't destroy history by rewriting it. Um, the other way you can use Git is developmental, which is often the way I use Git to manage my patch tree. And basically you treat a Git branch like a set of uncommitted patches, and you use Git commands to shuffle them around, change authorship, add bits, modify comments and the like. It's actually a very good method of using Git um, if you're just using it for development purposes rather than using it as a tree to show the world. So here's a brief history. As I said, um, Git is a fairly recent invention, and we all worked on it, but source control in Linux began effectively as the need to manage patches efficiently. If you look at the early releases of Linux from about 2.4.18 and before, it was basically Linus patching into his master kernel tree and releasing tarballs. And before that also, Linus reviewed every patch that went into his master tarball, which meant that there was a huge scalability problem. If you think of the modern Linux kernel, we can merge something like 10,000 patches in one release cycle, which is every three months. However, now we have this uh, system of maintainers who review patches, and they pass their trees onto Linus for a merger up to the top one. So effectively, what we did is spread out the load among the maintainers so that Linus doesn't have to review every patch. He will review patches that come to him directly, provided he likes them, but patches that come from a maintainer who will assume they have already been reviewed, and therefore he'll likely put their tree in straight away. Um, I have to say likely, because on the odd occasion, he does like to look at some of the trees I submit and has called me out if I get it wrong, or put patches in he doesn't like. But the point of doing this system is scaling. Um, in order that Linus is not the single bottleneck for a release, we have to scale it by using subsystem maintainers. Um, and obviously to do this type of scaling, we need a distributed source control system. Um, another reason we need a distributed source control system, and part of the reason why Linus likes to operate in the purely historical mode, is that we, after the SCO suit, really need to track contributions. This is almost essential for us. If you actually look in documentation submitting patches, you'll see that um, there's a whole set of paragraphs given to something called the Developer Contributor Agreement, which is the basis upon which people submit patches to the kernel. And the legal theory upon which it operates is that we can actually trace historically back who submitted every patch after we instituted this. And the initial tool for doing this was BitKeeper. Sometime in, I think it was 2000 or 2001, uh, Larry McVoy actually offered us BitKeeper for use in the kernel. So BitKeeper is a fully distributed, nicely scalable, uh, non-master-based, which is very important. What it means is there isn't a single master repository. Everybody who has a BitKeeper tree and also everybody who has a Git tree has effectively their own master copy of the kernel source. Um, so, as I said, we initially used it in around 2002. However, there was a break with Larry McRoy in 2005 where we had to stop using BitKeeper. But in the intervening three years, BitKeeper worked extremely well, uh, in spite of a huge number of complaints by open source type people about it being proprietary. And the thing it gave us was the distribution that we needed, the scaling of Linus.